Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, you are awake there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> You're still thinking about racing there, weren't you? Yeah. It, it's a bit with a sad heart today. It's our last on the road series. It's our last on the road series. Oh, yeah. I forgot the name of the dog. The little black one's name was Vega. That was actually Janet and Wayne's dog. Yeah. We were actually out in the woods, five acres that we owned. We got a little gravel road out there. And it was just the, the funniest story. The dogs had just met. And we're sitting down having lunch in the woods at a little picnic table, an area we cleared in the woods. And it's like, where'd the dogs go? You know, are they eating each other up or what? And we looked down the road, and I got the camera. And we're going to do, we yelled, Trixie. And they both turned around and looked at us like, we're just going on a little walk. I was like, okay, they're just fine. Yeah. A wonderful, wonderful story and wonderful memories of, of Wayne and to have him uh, with the Lord now. What a, what a, a poignant time. So it's our last on the road. Uh, next week, we'll have Jotham and Maria with us. And then we're going to start a new series. It might take us to, I hate to say the word, Advent. Yeah, it might take us to Advent. Uh, we're looking at the names of God. Jehovah, fill in the blank. Jaira, Jaira, and all those other names. So that's our, our next series in two weeks. But last on the road series, New Testament. We've been in the Old Testament a lot. We're in Acts 9, Acts 9, verses 1 through 9. This is Saul on the road to Damascus. Probably one of the most powerful and significant uh, encounters with God on a road bringing in the era of Christianity and Jesus here. So if you want to turn to Bibles this morning in Acts 9, as we uh, come to the Lord in prayer today, Lord, we thank you that you're a God on the road with us, or whatever road we're on. Lord, you are there, and you're calling us, and Lord, you're encouraging us, and you're inviting us. So we thank you for that invitation this morning. As we open your word, God, we invite you, Lord, to... Uh, reveal to us who you are. Lord, reveal to us who we are in your name. And Lord, that purpose you have in our life. So we thank you for Saul. We thank you for Luke recording this. And Lord, obviously you've had this in mind and for this purpose today. Lord, that we are on the road with you. And we pray, amen. So this is arguably one of the most dramatic and influential encounters with Jesus. The road to Damascus. And we're talking about Saul. Now, you're saying, who's Saul? Saul's name eventually becomes Paul. When he goes and starts his missionary journey to the Gentiles, his name is changed to Paul. But in the book of Acts, I'll refer to him as Saul because the text is Saul in here. But we're talking about Paul, you know, the writer of 13 books of the New Testament. The Paul is who this is. And we're specifically looking at the power of Jesus Thank you, Annette, for the songs that so fit in line with the text today. The power of Jesus in Paul's life and his conversion and the impact Jesus had, and specifically as it starts on this, his road to Damascus. So as with each of the other messages, we're reminded this morning, when we encounter God on whatever road that we're traveling, God meets us where we're at. If you walked in today and said, well, I'm not quite sure of if God's going to meet where I'm at, God meets you where you are at, and we'll hear about Saul here today, with the goal of bringing us closer to him. Jesus is all about bringing us, his people, closer to God the Father. And God is always looking out to revealing his plan in our life. We're his people. We were created by him, created for him, to be with him. And so specifically this morning, Saul's on the physical road to Damascus, but he is on a road of misunderstanding when Jesus encounters him. And here's the misunderstanding. We're starting our journey with a little background on, on Saul, okay? Acts 9.1. Acts 9.1, we're going to read the first three verses. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, you know, insight as to who Saul is here, he went to the high priest, he's in Jerusalem. He asked the high priest for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, 
150 miles away, so that if any, and if he found any belonging to the way, the name they use for Christians, men or women, that he, Saul, might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. So Saul is a devout Jew. He is devout. And he is zealous for the Jewish understanding of who God is. Old Testament law. He was so zealous, he was going around knocking on the doors to people that he saw in the synagogue worshiping and proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. And he'd go around door to door in Jerusalem, knocking on their doors. I heard you proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. Come with me, bound into prison with the potential of being killed for that faith. Okay? He was zealous for God. In chapter 8, it's described this way. He was ravaging the church, the new church. He was entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Paul in Jerusalem was very much aware of the worship of Jesus and the teaching. It was happening in the synagogues. That's where Christianity started with the Jews, right? And the teaching that Jesus was the Messiah. This is what Saul is fighting against. To the point of, you're going to jail for this. Unfortunately, the church is young. It's growing fast in the synagogues. This was to whom the message was first preached. And Saul would have none of it. He's in Jerusalem. This message is starting to go to the other towns. Damascus, 130-some miles away. And he says, i got to go there, too. we got to incarcerate those Christians, too. We've got to stop this. This is Saul's mindset. He goes to the priest. I need some letters. I'm going to go to those synagogues in Damascus. You're sending me. We're going to bind them. We're going to gag them. We're bringing them back to Jerusalem for, for prosecution. Those professing faith in Jesus were guilty and worthy of imprisonment and death. So we have Saul on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, right, with the goal of incarcerating the Christians. Just a quick aside, we see the speed at which Christianity is spreading now. Saul asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, he might bring them back to Jerusalem. Christianity was out of control. Right? This is a good thing, right? It's out of control in Saul's mind. We've got to get this under control. He's well aware there's believers as far away as Damascus now. He's got to stop this. And interesting, Luke writes, right? He refers to those believers as belonging to the way. Literal translation, belonging to that road. Huh? Right? <laughs> so here's Saul on his road to prosecute, to persecute the Christians. And Luke writes against those that are on the other road, the road to Jesus, a different way. So Saul, devoted to God, Old Testament scriptures, the truth of the scriptures, willing to travel over 100 miles to incarcerate people of the other road, the way. Letters in hand from the priests in Jerusalem. Ah, oh, man, he was ready. He's got his sword, right? This is Saul's understanding of working for God. Devout, learned Jew. With the support and the authority of the Jewish church to incarcerate and kill those from the other way. And then, the encounter with Jesus. Verse 3. Now as he, Saul, went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
right? God reveals himself physically to Saul. Anybody watch the storm last night? This is during the middle of the day, and a great light shone. This wasn't a flashlight. This wasn't lightning bugs at night. This wasn't, you know, a car on the road. There were cars on the road, right? During the day, there's a heavenly light, an inexplicable light, a miraculous light in the middle of the day. Saul on the road reveals God's presence to Saul. And making no mistake, God speaks. Boom! Hope you got lightning strikes in mind here, right? Boom! Reveals himself to Saul immediately, physically, by sight, and then by sound. God says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We don't hear much about persecution today. Saul, why are you troubling me? Be another translation. This is God. Saul, you're a bit of a trouble right now. And you might be in a little bit of trouble with me. Saul, why are you mistreating me? Saul, I'm the God, the God of the Old Testament. It's actually Jesus' voice. He says, Saul, this is me. This is God. Why are you mistreating me? Saul, why are you trying to keep me away from you? In Saul's zealous endeavor to persecute the church, he's actually keeping God at arm's length. Why are you persecuting me, God says. And here's Saul thinking that he was working for God. Right? He's doing this for his faith. Thinking that his passion for his faith in persecuting the Christians was what God wanted. And now God calls him out by name, Saul, why are you persecuting me? By persecuting the Christians, Saul was persecuting God, Jesus. By persecuting the Christians, God had taken notice. By persecuting the Christians, God had taken actions. He planted a new idea in Saul's thinking. Saul, what are you doing? What are you doing to me, Saul? Going to Damascus to incarcerate and possibly kill others? This is troubling Saul. Verse 5. Saul, he's prostrate on the ground now. He's on the ground. And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice and seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And they had to lead him by the hand to bring him into Damascus. And for three days, he's without sight and didn't eat or he didn't drink. Saul had just encountered the inexplicable. And he tries to put some understanding to it. He uses the word, who are you, Kyrios? Who are you, Lord? He hadn't, he hadn't gotten to the God thing yet, but this blinding light, this voice from heaven, was something that was due honor and respect and reverence. Even in the not knowing, who are you, Kyrios? I tell you, if I heard a voice from heaven and had a blinding light in the middle of the day, I'd be on the ground. Are you, Lord? Who are you? And then the revelation. Three little words. I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. Not I'm the Messiah. Not I'm the Son of God. Not I'm the seed of Abraham. Not I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The Word became flesh. Jesus comes to Saul. And he calls him by name oh, because Jesus had a plan for Saul's life. I just so beautiful. I mean, this is the ascended Jesus now, right? We're, we're at Acts. Jesus is in heaven, and he comes and reveals himself in the glory of God, and he speaks to Saul. He said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. 
But Saul, rise up, get up, enter the city, and I'll tell you what to do. Ah, oh, it's just so beautiful. Saul's sight was taken from him. There's a whole sermon here in the metaphor of being without sight until Jesus gives him the final directions, right? But for now, the man Saul, whose sights were on destroying Christians, was now without sight. Great. He's without sight. He's got to be led into Damascus to wherever they're going, and for three days. And he fasted, and he waited on the Lord. It says he's praying. He's praying to God. I don't think Saul's conversion had happened yet. It's not real clear in the text, right? It's not, he's obedient, yes. He goes in, his sight's taken from him, but has he given his life to Jesus yet? Maybe in Damascus. And then the understanding. He goes to Damascus. Those words, who are you, Lord? I can't speak, not eating. Cutting the story a little short. There is a man in Damascus, a follower of Jesus, one of those who Saul may have persecuted and and brought back to Jerusalem. Name was Ananias. God had told Ananias, I've told this man Saul that you're going to anoint him and you're going to heal him and the Holy Spirit will come upon him when you do that. So, So Ananias, will you do that? He goes, not the Saul, not the Saul, right, God? The one that's probably coming here to incarcerate us and kill us? That's not who you're talking about, right? That's the guy, yeah. I've got plans for him. I just need you to anoint him for me. Verse 17. Verse 17, we catch up. So Ananias departed, faithful to God, going to this man he knows has intent to kill him, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from his eyes, he regained his sight, and he rose and was baptized. He knew then this was Jesus. Ananias, at the Lord's command, he anoints Saul, he lays his hands on him, and God heals Saul and pours out his Holy Spirit upon him right there in Damascus. And Saul goes and gets baptized. Quick misunderstanding here. Misunderstanding, people heal people. Oh, doctors, nurses, right. Spiritual healing. People bestow the Holy Spirit upon others. Hear these words. Jesus sent me that you will regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are sent into the world so that God can work through us. God can work with us. We can't do anything for God, but God can work with us. We cannot heal, but God in us may bring healing. We cannot pour out the Holy Spirit, but God through us pours out the Holy Spirit. God used Ananias to heal and pour out his Holy Spirit upon Saul. We cannot preach, but God through us. We cannot teach, but God in us. We cannot bless, but God in us. Otherwise, it's my teaching, and it's my preaching, and it's your teaching. But God in us. And Saul was baptized. Two weeks. Let me know if you want to be baptized. Hopefully in the river here. Be baptized, Jesus says. Not me. I'll baptize you with water, but it's God who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So Saul's understanding had come full circle here. From a road bent on destroying Christians, Saul had now become that which he had sought to destroy. Isn't that beautiful? And God did it just like that. Just like that. Once persecuting people for their faith, he now realized that in so doing, he was persecuting Jesus. Christ in us the value of people in the world. God loves us and he meets us whatever road we're on. And isn't it beautiful? I mean, Jesus comes down and he goes, Saul, bad boy, here's your punishment. Right? It's the invitation. 
Saul, you're going down the wrong road. Come on, I got a road for you to follow. It's a beautiful invitation of whatever road you're on. Not an invitation of, of gloom and doom and judgment and punishment, right? But the invitation to come and follow me. And then with Jesus, we're under the new law of Christ. Saul, once jealous for God, now was jealous with God. Saul, once devout for God, was now devout with God. Saul was listening to God and not himself. Saul was allowing God to use him for the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. Write 13 books. Be the first major, first disciple to go into the Gentile world and preach and teach all over the Roman area. And God, Jesus, uses Saul as a beautiful example, showing us that we too need to call people to faith. Not condemn for their unbelief. Say it again. We need to call people to faith, not condemn for their unbelief, but to show them Jesus. Not to chastise them for their sins. Pretty grievous sin in Saul's part, would you agree? Killing the Christians. He doesn't chastise him for that. He says, that's the wrong road, Saul. But an invitation to come to Jesus. A call to love our enemies, not wish upon them destruction. And we all know the text. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your table this morning, Lord, we hear that invitation. Lord, you called Saul by name. Lord, you, you revealed to him, Lord, that his heart wasn't with you. It was trying to be for you. And God, you call us to so much more than that. Not just an understanding of who you are, but Lord, that willingness to walk with you side by side. And Lord, your desire to walk with us side by side. We thank you for that. God, your willingness to meet us wherever we are on this road in life, or whatever, whatever sins have gone before us, God, you are there saying, oh, come and follow me. Turn from your sins, and I'll wash them away. And Lord, this is why you came, to call the world unto yourself. And Lord, this is why you work in us, Lord, to be that light and that beacon to the world around us. And so, Lord, we come to this table today reminded of that, your invitation with those disciples that night as they prayed and as they feasted at that Passover meal. Lord, you broke that bread and reminded them and us now forevermore. Your body was given to us. It was broken for us. And your blood was shed for our sins to be forgiven by you when we turn from those sins. So God, we ask for your forgiveness this morning. Lord, we ask for our forgiveness, Lord, for wishing destruction upon our enemies when we know you give us those hard words to love our enemies. Lord, at keeping those that don't know you at arm's length instead of sending them your invitation that you love them and are calling them into your kingdom. So God, help us with that. Lord, for, for those whose sins, is so, sins are so obvious, we thank you for Ananias' heart, Lord. He looked at Saul and said, oh, God, not him. And, Lord, we know of those in our life where we look at them and say, oh, God, how could you ever, how could you ever change that life? God, we can't, but you can. Oh, Lord, we can't, but you can. And we thank you for your power in us. We thank you for your trust and your willingness to work in us. Lord, to reach those that others cannot. Lord, you've given us each a path and a journey to travel so that you can be present with us for those others around us. For this we stand in awe and we give you thanks and praise as we come to your table and we celebrate that gift that you've given to us. Your son died and rose again. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.